We are now on the record. Will the court reporter please swear in the witness? Miss Hall, that's a lineup. Do you see Kimberly Sons? This one looks like Kim. For the first time, a female serial killer convicted of one of America's worst crimes is about to give her side of the story. I'm Piers. Hi. Kimberly Sines says she's innocent. A picture's been drawn of what someone wants you to see. And that she was framed for the murder of five patients by a powerful healthcare company. Listen, there's a cover-up in healthcare all the time. I'm talking about Davia. I mean, could it have been somebody else? I know what she did. She was accused of injecting bleach into patients. But I still don't know completely why. I wanted her executed. Kim Sines didn't want death by injection, but in fact, it's exactly what she administered to five people. I told them, please don't let her touch me. Don't let her touch me no more. The jury convicted her. Her life was on the line. But now we can judge for ourselves. I know that I didn't do anything to harm another human being. It's not in my nature. When bleach is put into the blood, that's like being caught on fire from inside. I've been given one hour with science to get to the truth. Guilty for killing people for no reason. That makes a lot of sense. Doesn't make any sense. I guess DeVita got in your pocket, too. Kimberly believes that this is her opportunity to get her truth out there to the public. Now the question is, is it really the truth, or is it just an exercise in manipulation? Hi. Hi, Kim. Hello. I'm Piers. Kimberly, thank you very much for agreeing to see me. You, you. You've never given an interview. You didn't testify in your trial. This is the first time people who know about your case will have ever heard you speak, really. Why are you doing this? There's just a lot of things that was never said, and I believe it's time to speak out. And I find you a very reputable person, and I was trusting you for the story. Well, I'll certainly be fair. Yes. That's all I can be as an interviewer. But you're going to be honest with me. Yes. That's your intention? Yes, that is my intention. In 2012, former nurse Kimberly Sines was found guilty of killing five of her patients by injecting bleach into their dialysis equipment. But how does this small-town mum become one of the nation's most infamous murderers? When I looked into your story, what I found extraordinary was it starts so happily. You're at school, you're dating the most handsome guy mm. in the school, you're the envy of all the other girls, you end up having a baby with this guy, you marry him. It's like you've got a dream life. And yet, even remembering that is making you emotional. Yes. Because you've ended up here now in a position where, you know, you're one of America's most notorious female serial killers. That's what you've been convicted of. Can you... Explain how that happened. Well, I, I, I did have a good life and um, subsequent another marriage and another child. And I was very happy. And uh, I found myself working at a dialysis clinic that um, was more about money than they were about the lives of their patients. And um, there was a lot of things that happened. And... I was falsely accused of something, and that's why I'm here today. But I know that I didn't do anything that would have done anything to harm another patient, another person, another human being. It's not in my nature. Everybody on either side of the family was in support of Kim. There's never an inkling of a thought did she do it. And if somebody brought it up to me in that manner, they were shut down pretty quick. See, people will look at you and they'll, they'll be bemused because your family all seem to be on your side and believe your innocence. Your ex-husband speaks, you know, very fondly about you and is supportive. Yes, he's a good guy. He was a wonderful father um, and a stepfather for my son. Your father said uh, a number of years ago that 
all you wanted to do was take care of people. Yes. I had a type of pneumonia back in 99 and almost died. I was 24 years old. And um, my mom and dad almost lost me. And the nurses were so awesome and so caring. And that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to do what they did. And I wanted to give to other people what they gave to me. Kimberly's calling in life led her here to this dialysis center in Lufkin, Texas. It's owned by DeVita, one of the largest dialysis providers in the US. But it would soon become a major crime scene when patients suddenly started dying. What did you think about your job when you joined this dialysis unit? Well, um, I was actually excited because the hours were gonna work out real well and the pay was really high for any nurse in that area without me having to leave the town. When we went to training, they really made it out to seem like it was just gonna be an awesome job, just really great support and all the employees were just great. I first became acquainted with Kim Signs when we were training in Houston and she was a rather nice person, had a great personality. Um, she even read her Bible at night before we went to bed. When Kim went to work for the Beatles, she was happy. Barry. She was excited. And we were all proud of her because the dialysis patients are going through a lot. And uh, she was able to make the, the day, you know, lighter for what those people were going through. Eight months after Kimberly Science starts working at the dialysis center, a major incident occurs. It's April the 1st, 2008. That was a traumatic experience on that day. A patient dies during a routine dialysis treatment. This has never happened before at this unit. Do you remember Thelma? Yes. She was a very nice lady, though. Right. My mother was Thelma Frances Metcalf, and she uh, was very unique. Um, she enjoyed her church. She enjoyed her friends. Um, she enjoyed her grandchildren. My mother was a very outgoing person. She didn't have an enemy. Everyone seemed to like her, and um, she's missed. It's still hard. What kind of relationship did you have with patients? What, what did you feel about them at the, at the unit? Well, I always would treat them like I thought it was my mom or my dad or my grandmother. My grandfather at the time was fixing to start dialysis, and um, so I did have some some empathy there because I could always picture it being him. During Mother's Dialysis, uh, she made friends with some of the other patients that were there. You know, they kind of formed like a family setting. Um, there was a nurse, and at the time I did not know who she was, um, that Mom would make a few comments about. Well, I had this nurse today. She, you know, was kind of rude or... You know, I didn't like the way she did this. She was a little rough. Mother would have bruises on her arms. Um, it was hard for her to transfer sometimes when she was a little weaker. And we have kind of put the pieces together and uh, feel that that was Kim. Our daughter said she'd already had concerns about the way you had treated her mother. She said she'd often come home, her mother covered in bruises, but that didn't happen when other nurses cared for her mother. They would drop her off in the waiting room, and half the time they wouldn't even tell anyone she was there. And um, we would have to go looking for her, and it's very sad. Do you know how she got the bruises? I Could that be from wrestling her into well, the chair? Well, I, I suppose. I mean, I didn't have to. I could not physically lift her into the chair. I was too short. But you wouldn't need to, to lift but, those great bruising, right? I mean, you could. Yes. If it well, was, yes, sure. The day that she died, Mother had been sent to Memorial Hospital, and when I got there, Mother had already passed, and I reached down to kiss her on the forehead, and an overwhelming smell of bleach hit me, burned my eyes, and at that time I knew something wasn't right. Let me ask you this, Kimberly. If you heard about a nurse who was working in a dialysis unit 
who had put bleach into the dialysis machines with the deliberate intention of killing those patients. What would you think of that person? A monster. It would be hard yes. to imagine well, a worse yes, crime, right. right? Then people who are actually there because they're sick, relying on a professional nurse to take care of them. Do you think you have it in you to kill somebody deliberately? Do I? No. No. No, not at all. Every day we put our lives and those of our loved ones in the hands of medical professionals. But it is in the medical profession where you are most likely to find a female serial killer. If I ask the average human to name serial killers, not one of them would be a healthcare serial killer. And that's because even though they are the most prolific serial killers we have, they fly under the radar. The reason this happens is because as soon as you have a series of suspicious deaths on the watch of one particular nurse or sometimes a doctor, the facility knows to get rid of them. You had a number of jobs prior to the dialysis unit. But in every case, there was a no hire notice made about you. They didn't want to have you back, and none of these jobs lasted very long. What was going on there? In um, 2005, I think I first started noticing signs of depression and anxiety. Um, I would have problems being around people, um, like um, panic attacks. Um, I would just not show up for work. I had a hard time living life. There seems to be a lot of storminess in her history uh, that would suggest perhaps a borderline personality disorder. And she is very neurotic. What was your mindset when you started at DeVita? Well, um, mentally, I was not stable at all. But we needed the money, honestly. At the time, she was also going through a really, really rocky marriage. They had financial problems and things like that. The rumor was that she wanted to quit, but her husband had told her if she quit this job after she'd had several, it would mean a divorce. It's entirely possible that she just wanted to be a stay-at-home mom and be a traditional wife with a breadwinning husband. And in my mind, I really wonder if she just resents the fact that she has to work at all. Your marriage mm -hmm. also included a, an unfortunate incident which ended up with you being in a police cell overnight for mm -hmm. uh, allegedly assaulting you, yes. your husband. Mm -hmm. What what went wrong there? Me and my, my ex-husband, we had a, a love-hate relationship. And we argued a lot over money problems. Um, I was not in my right mind, but that's... Um, then we ended up arguing and... And you, you assaulted him? Yes. How do you feel about that? Horrible. I think she was just mad at the world. She was didn't like her job, and she wanted to cause problems. And so, on April the 1st, 2008, we begin a murderous month at the Dynasty Center. Thelma Metcalf dies on this day, but so too was 77-year-old Clara Strange. Two deaths on a single day, totally unprecedented. I had never saw episodes occur like that back to back. As soon as EMS left with one patient, another patient was going out. Clara Strange, she spent her working life in a school and after her own daughter died, she raised her daughter's children, her grandchildren, which was a pretty laudable thing. What were your feelings about Clara? I do remember her. She liked to cut up. She was wise. She liked to tell jokes. Um, she could be ornery at times. You weren't assigned to uh, Clara on the day she died, but when the assigned nurse, uh, Whirl and Guillory, took a break, you covered mm -hmm. for him. And it was at that point that um, Clara went into cardiac arrest. I do not remember her going into cardiac arrest when he was gone. Mm. Um, I know I had four patients and then his four patients. Um, during that whole time, I don't remember anything happening with her. And I had not, I, and I had made it, made them very aware I was not ready for four patients. But I wasn't given the opportunity. It was either you do it or, you know, mm. you leave. So 
everything is Davida's fault. She believes that she has too many patients, that it's way too much, and that bad things are going to happen. Now, Nurse Guillory, who was the person that you temporarily replaced, reported that you were disinterested when asked for help and didn't seem to care that Clara Strange's heartbeat has stopped. That is untrue. Not true? No, that is not true at all. I was concerned. I really was. I was concerned for the people there. Her reaction to these patients being in distress or having cardiac arrest were not the emotional reaction that you would expect from a dedicated health care provider. In fact, she goes out to have a cigarette while the people are coding. She's not trying to bring them back to life. She complains about having to do CPR to them when they're coding. Would you ever have just stood by and watched somebody die? No, that's ridiculous. The thing is, Kimberly, here's the problem I have with it all. This wasn't going on before you got there, and it hasn't gone on since you left. It's entirely possible she's done this before with other employers, and that's why she was let go with a do not rehire. They were dying, they were in comas, they were being raced to hospital. 80 ambulance trips compared to 16 in the same period before you got there. And there's been nothing like it since. Just this time when you were there, Kimberly. Just the time when you were there. If you look at all the bad things that was happening at Kimberly Signs at the time, if you put them on a timeline, they correspond with somebody dying. A former nurse killed dozens of hospital patients was charged today with murder. Authorities say Charles Cullen told them he gave lethal drugs to as many as 40, quote, very sick patients. He said he did it to ease their pain and suffering. Healthcare serial killers, they usually fall into one of two primary profiles. Your angel of mercy who's dispatching sick patients to let them go to heaven more quickly. And the other one, of course, is the attention seeker, the hero, the one who creates a crisis, and they do that for the attention. None of that fits with Kimberly. By April the 2nd, the dialysis center is now in a full-blown crisis, unable to explain how a third patient has died in exactly the same way as Thelma Metcalf and Clara Strange. I mean, the chances of one patient dying of cardiac arrest on a dialysis machine is about 7 in 100,000. But the odds of two patients dying that close to each other on a dialysis machine was described as astronomical. Well, and I would probably agree if I knew the, the statistics. However, did they know that Davidas was, had, chlor, had to replace their water treatment system because they were not cleaning the chlorine out of there? patients were getting sick and they were having to be rushed to the hospital or they were dying and the other patients was looking around like what's going on the thing is Kimberly the ambulance trips just exploding in number mm -hmm. five six times as many from the moment you started it as normal this is like total like carnage right i mean this has gone from 14 in six months to 18 well, yeah, the next seven they months. were we were having codes right and left but why do you think it was uh, all happening once you joined well no i never i never put two and two together like that several of those folks were pretty active and although they were dialysis patients they didn't have any immediate expectation of death so it was it was really quite shocking in the second week of April, three more patients are rushed to hospital with life-threatening cardiac arrests. What was your view of patients? What did, what did you feel about them at the, at the unit? Are you a compassionate they, person naturally? I, I believe I am, yes. Um, I felt sorry for them. No, but it came up in court that you told staff you didn't like the patients which you had been charged with helping. That's silly. I would never say something like that. I mean, that's a person, a human being. Each and every day before I came to work, I had to say a prayer because you didn't know if it was going to be your patient or someone else's patient. By April 16th, the number of fatal incidents is about to increase again. When Garland Kelly came into the facility, he was happy, he was singing, he was just so vibrant on that day. And what happened to God? He was actually my relative. So, please tell you, I didn't, I didn't <laughs> yeah. Do you want to talk about that? 
Uh, not really. Mr. Garland Kelly. He went into cardiac arrest while undergoing dialysis. And he was rushed to the hospital. Do you remember Garland Kelly? I never took care of him, so I don't remember a whole lot about him. He was 58, had three daughters, he was a football coach. He died and was in a coma for four months. Never regained consciousness before he died. Yes, I remember I was by the, I was given medication to another patient. Hmm. And I remember his alarm just kept going off and I asked her, do you want me to get that? And she was coming from the nurse's desk and she ended up turning it off. I think Kim Sines had a very callous attitude towards her patients. She seemed disinterested and um, very passive in the critical events that happened. It was reported you told the staff you didn't like Garland because he took too long to treat. It took up uh, all your time. You didn't like this patient. I find that odd that I don't like any of the people. Right. Why would they keep saying that? I, well, I know that all the ones that were employed with DeVita, when they got on the stand, they lied. As events started to occur more often, um, we had monitors and clinical specialists that came in. Multiple deaths, no suspects, and nothing to link any of the victims together. Unable to explain the fatalities, the dialysis clinic launched an internal investigation. But the death toll keeps on rising. Saturday, April 26th, was the last day a patient would die at the Vita. And that patient was Miss Opal Few. Opal Few was 91. She had three children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Do you remember Opal? Yes. What was she like? She was a lovely lady. Mm. Do you remember her fondly? What, why are you finding it um, so upsetting to, to... Because she just reminded me of my grandmother, that's all. And yet, a number of your colleagues said you didn't like her because she moaned and made noises during treatment. And you felt resentful about it. <clears throat> that is crazy. That's not true. No. <sighs> what you have with Kimberly Sings is... A disgruntled employee. She is dispatching patients in revenge against her employer, DeVita, because she feels overworked, unappreciated, and she can't stop. I mean, the investigation is going on all around her, and she can't stop. I how, many, how many people can you credibly accuse of lying before eventually people say, well, hang on, Kimberly, it's you that's lying here. I don't think you've looked into all of this. I have looked into all of it, yeah. My problem is I just don't believe it. Okay. I mean, my question, Kimberly, is did, did you kill all these people? No, I did not. Kim was always a very sweet-talking person to me. She would hook me up to the machine and get me started, and then she would make periodic checks to come and check my vital signs. And uh, she was just a nice person to me. There was people who liked Kimberly signs. Don't get me wrong. Most of the time, she was with me. Okay. And I enjoyed it because she could really stick. Okay. You know, it ain't everybody can stick your arm. But none of the patients saw this coming from her. None of the employees, except maybe one, had a suspicion about Kimberly signs. Did you get on with these other staff, or did you did you have a bad relationship with them? Well, I did have a bad relationship with Candace and with Whirlin because I he wanted to go out with me. Hmm. Do you think he was some sort of revenge? What he was saying? Well, I was shocked that he said the things he said on the stand. He was lying. Yes, not completely, but there were some things he said that was a lie. Yes. Isn't they're all lying? Yes. In just four weeks, five patients have had fatal incidents and 12 have experienced near-death cardiac arrests. Then, on April the 28th, investigators get a major breakthrough. Does that photo look familiar to you? Yes. This is the workstation where she was standing, and this is where she set the, 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 the bleach container down on the floor. 
Dialysis patients and former medical workers Linda Hall and Lurleen Hamilton report seeing the same nurse use a syringe to draw fluid from a bleach container. The first thing hit my mind, this, that ain't sanitary. These two patients had a medical background. They worked in medical facilities. It was the fact that she set the bleach pan on the floor that caught their attention. She took the syringe out of her pocket and, and squat down. And you could see her pulling back on the syringe, filling it up. And uh, and I saw her go take the syringe and put it into Miss Rome's IV tubing. Then she injected it in Miss Washington's husband was there, and he was shouting out, "What's wrong with my wife? Who done did something to my wife?" In Marva Roan's case, there were two eyewitnesses who say they saw you actually poisoning her blood with bleach. Yeah, there were two that I've had, that I had had experience with, both of them. A bad experience? Bad experience? No. I'd had experiences with them. But why would these two patients invent the fact they'd seen you? Well, first of all, neither one of them could see. Right. <laughs> um, so they were blind? Or? Oh, yeah, they They're were. Blind. So they were lying too because obviously couldn't no, have seen. No, I did draw it up because I was making it for a cleaning solution. Right. I wasn't making it to go kill somebody. But they're all lying, all these people. Yes. All the staff who said that you spoke badly about patients mm -hmm. were, were liars. Well, are all these people who are still employed by DaVita like they were during the trial? That would, make, that would make it an extraordinary conspiracy, wouldn't well, it? Wouldn't it? Well, you would think, yes. Yeah. She is saying what all perpetrators say when they get caught. They blame the system. They blame their co-workers. They feel like they are the victim. And this is part of psychopathic behavior, is to blame and point the finger at everybody but yourself. Basically, Kimberly Sines was caught in the act. And if she hadn't done what she did at the time, with the two patients there who had medical backgrounds. There's no telling how long this would have went on. I told them, please don't let her touch me. Don't let her touch me no more. Because whatever she did to Ms. Rohn, I don't want her to do it to me. On the morning of April the 29th, Kimberly Science is fired by her employer. That afternoon, Lufkin police bring her in for questioning. All right, Kim, uh, I'm Corporal Shirley. This is Sergeant Abbott. You're not under arrest. And uh, there's some things that we want to sit down and discuss with you. Okay. One of the first things that crossed my mind was that it was an act of malpractice. They were trying to cover up some medical issue, negligence they had done. We also wanted an opportunity to speak with Kim Sines to get her version of the events and what happened. Are you from Lufkin area? Mm -hmm. I grew up in Central all my life. Okay. And I went to A&E and Angelina, Angelina Nursing School. Mm -hmm. Kim was talkative, chatty. You could tell she was nervous, but we told her what the allegations were, asked for her explanation of it. She began to offer one. I don't know what's going on, and I'm scared to leave my patients. I don't know if it's in the water system. Have they been checking all that? Yeah, that's what they said. And I'm just curious, what if if our machines are hooked up and they have some bleach in them? I, you know, I haven't researched into that, but I just have to wonder what kind of reactions would have happened. The video interview is kind of interesting because she immediately kind of brings the topic into bleach. It went from it's possible that it's a cover-up and that she's innocent in this to maybe she did have a role in this. When police investigate Kimberly's internet search history, her involvement in the deaths looks undeniable. The day after the first two deaths, on mm -hmm. April the, the 1st, in the early hours of the next morning, you were searching on the internet for 
all sorts of strange things connected to this. Can you be killed by bleach on Dallas machines and mm-hmm. so on? How do you explain that? When I came in, I was very distraught. Two people had died in one day. But, but these searches, Kimberly, look, bleach poisoning, chlorine poisoning, bleach mm-hmm. given during dialysis. Can bleach be detected in dialysis yes. lines? I think that dialysis was... patient symptoms of bleach infusion. I mean, can bleach be detected in dialysis mm-hmm. lines? Yes. It strikes think... me as that's not somebody curious. That's somebody looking to how you, you would cover up such a crime. Yes. Kimberly Sines got on her computer and she did research can bleach be detected in dialysis lines? And the answer she got back was no. So at that point, I believe Kimberly Sines had figured she had just found a perfect murder weapon. But just to clarify, you did make the searches. You're not, yes, dis- you're not yes. disputing that. Yes, no. No, right. But why would you be asking, can bleach be detected in dialysis lines? So that's a specific question. I don't understand why you would ask that. I don't know if that's, is that exactly what was typed in? Yeah. I've always thought it was the water system. I do know that the water treatment system, how it wasn't cleaning all the chlorine out of the lines, and that not everyone was rinsing their machines after they pushed the bleach through, which we did twice a week. If there was contaminated water, all the patients would have gotten sick, not just selected individual patients. It's either the water, which nobody believes apart from you and a few people, or it's you. And that you were a cold-blooded serial killer who, for whatever reason, wanted these patients dead. Police are now convinced science is involved. Investigators send the equipment used during dialysis treatment to be tested for bleach. Several bloodlines test positive, but the really damning evidence is found inside a syringe used on patient opal fume. They later found a syringe labeled with opal's name, which supposedly had a medication, but actually had bleach inside it. And that was one of the main reasons you were convicted, in fact, because they could see clear evidence that bleach had been put into a syringe where there's supposed to be other medication and put into the machine and killed someone. Oh, that's not what happened it's not, at all. No. No. I mean, those syringes were found in the sharps containers, which are covered in bleach. There are even... The tops of the sharps containers have blood all over them. There's bleach everywhere, including in the water treatment system. There is no reason that something which contains medicine should ever have bleach in it. That was the light bulb moment. And then once we trace those back to when they were administered, they were administered by Kim Science. There's no other explanation than murder. In the expert witness testimony that was given in court, mm-hmm. they explored all the theories, and the reality is they came to the absolutely incontrovertible conclusion that somebody had deliberately put bleach into these dialysis machines and had killed these people quite deliberately, and that the only person that could possibly have been, because you were the only one around these machines in every single case, was you. That's not true. And goodness knows how many others with other drugs, like heparin and stuff, which people believe were being used on patients in this facility. And the common theme of all of it, in the end, is you. This wasn't going on before you got there, and it hasn't gone on since you left. But if they replace the water system, $250,000 worth. You're not taking everything into consideration. No, I am, I am. From all the evidence, if I'd been on that jury, I'd have convicted you. Why should we believe that you didn't? A lot of people have asked me, do you really think she killed five people? And my answer to that surprises some. No, I don't think she killed five people. I think she killed at least 19. This is where I come to uh, remember and talk with my mother. And here it says, unseen, unheard, but always near, sadly missed, 
but always dear. And um, it's very true. I wanted her executed. What Kim Sign did was horrible. When bleach is put into the blood, that's like being caught on fire from inside. And how long that hurt her, I don't know. But I wanted them to do the same thing to her. And it still hurts. It still, I, I still can't say I forgive her. I pray about it. And I hope one day I'll be able to. Um, but not today. Today in the capital murder trial of an East Texas nurse convicted of killing five kidney dialysis patients by injecting them with bleach. Jurors who convicted 38-year-old Kimberly Sins on Friday handed down a life sentence today. She will never be eligible for parole. One of the things they looked at during the trial was all the patients that died, not only the five that she was convicted of, but the others who had died too. She was the only single person who had worked during the time that every single one of them had died. There was not evidence, they couldn't bring her to trial, but most people involved in that trial believed that she killed more people. Convicted on five counts of murder and three of aggravated assault, science narrowly avoids the death penalty but she will never be released from prison. We did not choose to forego the death penalty for her or the victim's family. We did it for her family, really. She had two children. You know, our hearts went out to them. How did you feel when you were convicted? Um, in shock. Hmm. I was... You were convinced you were going to be acquitted? Yes. I guess it was hard because a lot of the things the judge wouldn't let in. Um, I didn't realize how much the money, um, how much money can cover things up and can do a lot, especially in a small East Texas town. The one question everybody wanted me to ask you, do you know what it was? Mm -mm. Why? Sure. Why did you do it? I can imagine, yes. Why? That's, that's the question and they all wanted to ask. That's what I asked too. Why? Why? Why would I do this? Yeah, but I'm asking you. These are people with children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, many of them doing great work in their communities, who had dialysis machines to try and help their health, and you ended their lives. Mm -mm. Why? Why did you do it? I didn't. And why would I? I had nothing against any of those people. I think that Kimberly Sines was so miserable that she was murdering patients that wasn't as miserable as she was. Even all these years later, she is still a disgruntled employee who blames DeVita for their malfeasance. They're the ones who caused the death. It wasn't her, it was them. So when Piers will not buy her line, doesn't go for her story, won't agree that she's innocent, she is right back to blaming her employer. This is how she gets through her days, by believing that this is all DeVita's fault. And I believe if you would truly look into it, you would see that. We looked into everything. I don't believe y'all looked into this. You know, Kimberly, it's just my final observation. Sometimes I've interviewed a lot of people who've killed people. Sometimes... The easier thing is just to admit it. <laughs> That's the path to atonement. There can be no path to atonement if you don't admit what you did. And maybe you're in denial to yourself. But you and I know that you did even, this. No, I did not. That don't even make sense. It does make sense. Okay. I, I really you, thought you were going to help me. Help you what? Help me to get the truth out. Thanks a lot. I think we did get the truth out. I guess he got in your pockets, too. What about my pockets? I guess Davida got in your pocket, too. No one from Davita. Yes, know any apparently they did. I don't, you know anybody from, I don't know anybody from Davita. I never met anybody from Davita. I've only met Whatever. you. Whatever. I, I just think you're guilty. I'm sorry. Okay. Guilty for killing people for no reason. That makes a lot of sense. It doesn't make any sense. 
Well, that was a fascinating encounter with Kimberly Science. What's interesting is she'd never been asked these kind of questions before. And she clearly felt that I was going to just fall for her, in my view, utter lies and manipulation. But when you take a, a really hard, cold, logical look at the facts here, you only reach one conclusion. She killed all those patients and tried to kill many more. Why would anyone do that? I'm Emily Campagno. As a lawyer, I've spent many hours with convicted felons inside the walls of prisons. Those are conversations and experiences you never forget. Now, Piers Morgan is joining me here in a slightly less intense environment to take you inside the killer interview. A female serial killer. We don't see that a lot. You know, I found this one of the really more unsettling ones because there was this very ordinary looking woman staring at me with sort of doughy eyes like she was from the local church group or something nothing screamed serial killer nothing suggested about her being a serial killer and yet she had deliberately and systematically ended multiple people's lives by injecting stuff into their diabetic machines and it was just terrifying and she preyed on the weakest of the weak and yet seemed shocked you didn't believe her. There's no doubt she did this. But there's also no doubt that in her head she may have convinced herself she didn't. But I think there's no doubt she did this. And I think she's no doubt she would have carried on doing it. Has this underscored the fragility of life to you? I think it's shown me once again, particularly this series, that one minute you can be enjoying a nice happy, trouble-free life. And the next second, everything changes. Either your life can be taken, the life of someone you love can be taken, life of somebody you know can be taken, but life can be very fragile, particularly in the orbit of any one of these eight killers. Because their view of human life is not the same as ours. Don't assume that everybody out there values life in the way that you do. Some people can kill you like that and never think about it again. Piers, this has been extraordinary. Thank you for sharing your insight with us today. Thank you. There was always that doubt in the background that he could be just a, the unluckiest guy in the world. 62-year-old convicted murderer Carl Carlson wants you to believe he's guilty of nothing more than having bad luck. It appeared that tragedy was stalking Carl Carlson. His horses died, his wife died, his son died. The truck fell on my stepson. His truck was crushed. This was an accident. Carl was just so traumatized by it. There had been a fire at my sister's house, and my sister did not make it out. His first instinct was to save his children. He must be devastated. It killed me. But is Carlson's misfortune a cover for something more sinister? Christina's family was suspicious. Carl was horrible with money. Unfortunately, when Carl Carlson needs money, people have accidents. 
believe I had a life insurance policy. Over seven hundred thousand dollars. I don't believe in coincidence. Do you? I've been given one hour, Carlson. Come sit down. Who says he was forced into a confession? There's something about Levi that haunts you, Carl. I, I know it does. The interview lasted for ten hours. <laughs> I didn't kill my son. Absolutely, he maintains his innocence. But this man saw his family members as a meal ticket. He told me she's a crispy critter. He doesn't kill them with his bare hands. He doesn't stab them. He doesn't shoot them. He creates a hazardous situation and then sits back and lets his situation kill them. Can Carl convince me of his innocence? My question for you is this, Carl. Are you the world's unluckiest human being, or are you a ruthless killer? Carl, how are you? How are you, sir? Piers Morgan. Carl. In the 90s, Carl Carlson's family home in Murphy's, California, burns to the ground. His three children thankfully survive, but his wife, Christina, does not. 29 years pass before a jury rules that this wasn't a tragic accident, but premeditated murder. Carlson had set the fire to kill his wife. But he says he's innocent. Carl, thank you for agreeing to see me. You've been in prison for how long now? Almost 10 years. What's that been like for you? You know, it's tough mentally. And especially knowing that I'm trying to get people to listen. Did you ever think you'd end up? Never. In prison, potentially for the rest of your life? Never, never. What do you hope to achieve with the interview? <laughs> to prove that, number one, I'm innocent. Number two, that... I didn't get a fair trial. What age were you when you met Christina, your first wife? Uh, I was 23. I mean, she, she was beautiful. I mean, I mean, she really was. And personality that you just, you don't find. She really saw the best in people. So you were properly in love with each other? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Were you a good husband, do you think, to her? I'm looking back, I worked a lot. We can always be better. Carl was not happy in Murphy's. He wanted to go back to New York, and my sister had told him, we're not going to go back to New York unless you have a job with benefits. So Carl was stuck in Murphy's, whether he wanted to be there or not. So there was definitely issues in the house. Tell me about this awful day when you had this tremendous fire at the house. Started off New Year's Day. And um, was out at the barn in the garage. So they were all in the house and you were outside? Correct. Okay. And it was a short time later that I heard Carl Holger Carlson get the kids. Carl Carlson was unable to access the house because the flames had consumed so much of it already. Carl then decided to save his children from the outside of the home and heroically broke the window and was able to reach in and grab them and pull them out to safety. And all this while, it's like, I'm not hearing the wife, so I figure, okay, she must have went out a different way. There's a back door. We you assumed your wife had escaped. Yeah, I mean, it's like you're assuming she's alive. She, There was no, help me, I'm trapped. There's no... I'm, I'm, I'm screaming in pain or anything. Christina Carlson's attempts to flee to safety were basically done to no avail. She tragically died inside of the bathroom. How did you feel when you knew Christina was dead? Devastated. It's your wife. You know, still love her to this day. Well, what state were you in? My reaction was just total blank. I, it's like I couldn't comprehend that she didn't get out. 
He saved his three children. He went toward the burning house. And there was actually an article written about him in the local paper back in California, praising him as this hero. Once you knew your wife was dead, you moved quite quickly to New York. What was that decision about? It was, where am I going to stay? Because my father-in-law said I could stay with him. Every day I would have to look at him and think, he lost his daughter and I didn't save her. How do you do that? Mm. So my dad was like, you know, come on home, get things settled down a little bit, and then we'll go from there. And it's like... I mean, a cynical person, and I'm not taking a view about this, but a cynical person would say, the other reason you might not want to be with your father-in-law is because he killed his daughter. Yeah, I mean, you could sit there and say that, but... I mean, him and I, he still, even after she passed away, he would come out to New York to visit. Right. That wasn't a permanent thing. I, we didn't know what we were going to do. Carl and the kids are gone. They didn't tell us. They didn't say anything to the family, like, we're going to go back to New York. My mom and her husband had to chase him down at the airport to say goodbye to the grandkids. Christina's family was suspicious about the fire that resulted in her death. Many of them didn't trust Carlson. Many of them felt that he was not sufficiently grieving enough for her death. You didn't go to the funeral. Why, why was well, that? Well, they didn't even call me and tell me when they were burying her. Well, why they, would they exclude you? I don't know. You must have a feeling. For... No, we c- there, there was no reason. It's the most reason. bizarre thing I've ever heard. I mean, a Well, this group. is what I said. It's like, and now all of a sudden, it's like after this all goes down, they're like, I'm the bad guy. Wouldn't it be easy for you and your conscience to just say, you know what, I did this, and actually, I should stay in prison? That would be the lie. Would it? 100%. Mm. Because I got the evidence to prove otherwise. But so how does it feel if you didn't do it, and you're sitting here as a convicted killer? It's the worst thing you can imagine. fire in California is officially recorded as accidental. Carl Carlson receives a huge insurance payout. This wouldn't be the last time a terrible misfortune would bolster Carlson's bank balance. When your wife died, it turned out that you'd taken out a life insurance policy Correct. and it paid out to you $200,000, yes. uh, which was... in today's money is nearly half a million dollars. Be the equivalent. Oh. You were the only beneficiary of that. Right. And then... The and, whole... you, and, and what people are curious about is you took out that policy 19 days before the fire. Right. But we had been in talks with the insurance company for probably four or five months. Right. You understand why people... Yeah. You can sit the there timing. and look at it that way. Yeah. But I, I had no debts. Right. So just a coincidence. Yeah. Yes, I collected insurance money. What did I buy with it? A house. For my kids. Mm. I didn't go get an 18-year-old girlfriend. I struggled to rebuild a whole life again. I was a single father for years. After the fire, Carlson moves his three children, Erin, Katie, and Levi, nearly 3,000 miles across the country to be close to his family in Seneca County, New York State. Two years later, he finds love again. You rebuild your life, and at a line dancing uh, club, you meet Cindy, your second wife. Correct. What was that like for you to to find love Um, again? It was a little bit of fresh air, because being a single parent is is tough. Being a guy single parent is tough. Thinking, okay, you know, you got to find somebody that's going to want to jump in and accept three kids. First time I met Carl... He pretty much told me um, his story of you know, how his first wife died in a fire and that he had three children and he was raising them by himself. And I just really felt sorry for him. The kids took to her very well and things were going good. I think it was a change of pace for them and um, we pretty much bonded. You know, it was a little bit harder, I think, for Levi because, you know, there's two sisters and he's the only brother. I believe he was, you know, mama's boy and he loved his mother and missed her terribly. 
Carl Carlson had been married to Cindy, his second wife, for 15 years, when one day in November 2008, tragedy would strike the Carlson family again. 911, what are your emergency? I think I need an ambulance. Okay, what's going on? Carlson and his wife Cindy were attending a funeral. Levi, he was working on the car at the Carlson ranch, and he was alone. We pulled into the driveway, and I saw that Levi's truck was still in the same spot. And I went in the house, and it wasn't long after that that Carl came and was banging on the kitchen window hysterically, telling me to call 911. The truck fell on my stepson. The truck fell on your stepson? Yes, and we just got home, and I don't think he's alive. Cindy knew Levi was dead the minute she saw him. He's pinned underneath the uh, truck? Yeah, my husband's lifting up the truck. I don't think he's alive. Levi... His chest was completely concave. Oh, my God. Is he breathing? No. He is not breathing. Okay. No. I find him out of the truck, jack it up, and uh, get him out. The wife's there, uh, neighbor's there, and we both pick up the shirt, and there's his chest is just crushed. Okay, we're going to start CPR, okay? Well, they want to start CPR. Do you know CPR? His chest is crushed. His chest is crushed. It was just one of the worst things that I had ever witnessed, you know. I was, it was just horrible. When the paramedics arrive, Carl is now banging his head against the garage walls. He's hysterical. He can't be consoled. But he's lost his son. He must be devastated. It killed me. I cried like a baby out in the, in the barn. Anybody will tell you. Carl was just so traumatized by it. From an outside observer, it appeared that tragedy was stalking Carl Carlson. That nearly 20 years prior, his wife had tragically died. And now in 2008, his son had tragically died. Shortly after Levi died, Carl had come from town. He had um, a letter, an envelope in his hand, and he had said Levi had a life insurance policy. And I said, what? You know, it seems strange to me that, you know, a 23-year-old would have a life insurance policy. 17 days before his death, you take out an insurance policy. Well... Well, you did, right? I'm not taking a... This is... I, okay. It's you, the way you're wording it is... Okay. I did not How would you take categorize it? it? I would say he took it out. And so how much did he pay out? It was a $400,000 policy with three hundred accidental. So $700,000. Correct. Who was the beneficiary if he died? I was. Okay. But I over... Well, hang on. You said you were going to give the money to Levi's two daughters. I mean, how much of the 700000 did you end up spending yourself? Not much at all. And there was a duck farm, I believe you started, right? Yeah, but that was before he died. Mm. I had my own retirement. My house was, my farm was paid off two years prior to Levi dying. Mm. My vehicles were paid off. Carl was horrible with money. I mean, it seemed like he spent and would worry about bills later. As time went on, you know, some of the statements would come through and the numbers didn't look right. I realized that the money that he got from the um, insurance, it was never meant for Levi's daughters. He was slowly draining all of the money out of those annuities and policies that he had set up for the girls. Things aren't adding up. You know, I thought, could Carl have killed Levi? Carlson wants me to believe that the death of his son, Levi, was just another in a series of terrible tragedies. Three homes, two cars, and a barn housing Carl's prized rare breed horses all went up in flames. In total, six seemingly tragic accidents have one thing in common. Carl Carlson. Why, 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 why? Why are you so damn unlucky, Carl? Uh, yeah, but did you ever see my medical no, records? Ask, ask no, me the question. I, no, this, why are you so unlucky? It's just... 
Huh? I don't know. You don't know? I know people that had a house fire, rebuilt their kitchen, and a week later after it's done, the house burns down again. And when your bad luck normally correlates with a massive payout from an insurance company, I'm doing the math and it stinks. We did for amongst ourselves that Carl Carlson is a man that was into get-rich-quick schemes. He had this idea that he was going to sell gourmet ducks to oriental restaurants downstate. He was going to be this incredible millionaire, but he messed it up. He was the type of man that if you gave him 20, he'd spend 40. At one point, he had thousands of ducks and no buyers. So then he kills all the ducks personally and just leaves them to rot out on the farm. And then in the early 2000s, the fire that killed those horses. I think you've deliberately done all these things for money. I don't think any of it mattered to you. Your favorite horses, they had to go. Your car, up it goes. I lost money. Mm. Let's, let's look at it this way. The barn I got 60000 for. Mm. The estimated loss was 365000 mm. Who burned something down for a loss? I think you'd burn anything down, Carl. For a loss? I think you'd burn cars, barns. Yeah. Your life unraveled when Cindy, your second wife suddenly starts to do her maths and starts to think, hang on a second, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. I started thinking, well, could Carl have done the barn fire? And why would Carl kill Ginger, his prized mare? She meant a lot to him. So it took me a while of learning who Carl is and was to realize that, you know, he had done these horrible things. I was living in fear and looking over my shoulder and I had to sleep in the same bed with him, which was horrible. I kept scissors and pepper spray underneath the mattress, you know, in case something happened in the night. She's desperate to go to the police, but the investigator keeps telling her, it's not enough evidence. You can't do that yet. You've got to wait. Cindy decides to take matters into her own hands. On three separate occasions, she secretly records her conversations with Carl. And finally, he admits he had a hand in Levi's death. I had a voice recorder. I stuck it in my bra. Um, one thing he told me is he had realized he forgot to put the blocks under the truck. And if he'd have done that, the truck wouldn't have fallen on Levi. So basically, he's like, it's my fault. It happened, and I feel horrible. I feel so guilty. Even though the recordings are barely audible, they're enough to persuade the police to investigate. They put a wire on her in the hope that she can trap Carl into repeating his confession. But by now, he's getting suspicious. I asked you if you pushed the truck and you said yes. I didn't push the truck, I said. I said I had nothing to do, but I said I took advantage of the situation once it happened. And that is exactly what it is. Carl, you told me that you didn't set it up that way, but when you were in there, you saw the opportunity. No, after it had happened. And I panicked and saw the opportunity. That's exactly what I said. What did you mean by what we heard and you say? So the thing is, is what that did you mean about I opportunity? Told, yeah, but I'm getting that. She's accused you of deliberately killing your son. But she has. And your response is, I didn't do it deliberately because you feared you were being set up here. So you didn't want to criminate yourself. But then you say this strange thing, Carl, which because I can't get just, my head around. Yeah, but you're what just, does it mean to make an opportunity from your son's well, tragic Well, you're just death? trying to give her enough. I don't know. I really don't. Explain to me. Just, well, you're trying to give her a little ammunition to see where she's going to go with this because I have no clue what. But what does that mean? Give to, well, you're trying to see what she's going to do. It's an unbelievable thing to say. But I'm trying to understand. Right. And any I man, agree. any man who can say his son's death is an opportunity and admits that is and admits that's despicable and horrible. I'm asking myself right now, what else are you capable of? You see the interview. There's something about Levi that haunts you, Carl. I, I know it does. 
and you see them trying again and again to trap Carl. What kind of father are you, piece of shit? Exactly. They're unable to do it. <laughs> we were ready to go to trial. We were confident we were going to get a conviction. Here's the bottom line. I don't believe you. You're bullshitting me like you bullshit everybody else. I didn't kill my son. Let me ask you one question. What do you regret about all this? Everything. Right. Trusting people. Mm. Trusting an ex-wife. Cindy collected enough evidence against her husband, allowing detectives to bring him in for questioning. You guys don't know what happened that day. Tell us about it. Ten grueling hours, Carlson was asked about his son's death. Levi had been working underneath a truck, which had fallen and killed him. Oh, my God. Justice Christ. Ruled an accident of a time, detectives now believed Carlson had a hand in it. There's something about Levi that haunts you, Carl. I, I know it does. Anything you do to wiggle out of this, he did for 10 hours. What are you going to do for me? I'm going to stand up and say this wasn't premeditated, cold-blooded murder. That it was just something that happened. Shit happens sometimes, Carl. But there came a point where finally... Carl broke down and started to cry and said, I opened the truck door. Okay. <laughs> you know, it was an accident. It was an accident. <laughs> and if I had hit the fucking box underneath it, it wouldn't have happened. Carl, what was an accident? Why'd you try and hide it? <laughs> I let him down. I walked away. And I lived with that for four years. Carlson was charged with murder as a result of that interrogation. You left your son there dying when you could have helped him. You could have come to his aid. You could have saved him. Did well, you call 911 for help? I did. Did no, you call for help? No. And so he needed help, and you don't give him help? What kind of father are you? Piece of shit. Exactly. I need to put on a show to make it so nobody knows it happened. No problem. Everybody buys it. The police buy it. Cindy buys it. I get my seven hundred thousand dollar policy. Carl Carlson entered a guilty plea in New York the day before the trial. I have to admit I was a little disappointed. Uh, we were ready to go to trial. We were confident we were going to get a conviction. Carl pled guilty to second-degree murder. He said, I caused the truck to fall on my son because I jumped in it and it tipped over. And then rather than saving him and getting him out from under the truck, I left him there knowing that he would die. The judge went over the elements of the crime with Carl, and I'll have to tell you, it was pretty creepy listening to him because he showed about as much emotion as somebody talking about the weather. You received a sentence based on your admission right. of second-degree murder right. of your own son. Right. I mean, you did that. Right. Oh, I, I, I agree I did that. So now your position is that you, you made all that up. Yes. I didn't kill my son. So how does it feel if you didn't do it and you're sitting here as a convicted killer of your I wish I never would have taken the lawyer's advice and took a plea. I don't get why you You know what my convinced? lawyer told me the first day you met me? He goes, this is a heater case. A heater case is so high profile, it doesn't matter what you say or do, you're mm. going to lose. Mm. To play devil's advocate oh. with you and just to try and get to the truth here. Yep. But, you know, people have said that the only reason you took that plea was because you were facing life without parole. Yeah. And you took a plea which maybe gave well, you 15 well, years. Well, well, and then plus the one thing, like I say, you never get, when you take a plea, you never get your right to appeal. You never get a, your right to challenge your conviction. But you understand why some people think you right. deliberately right. took the plea and made the confession to get a short sentence. I can understand that 100%. But many people do take a plea mm. to get a lesser sentence. When you're facing life or 15 years, you're going to take the 15 because you know you can do 15. It's terrible. But here, here's well, it is terrible, thing. yeah. But here's the, here's the thing. It's terrible. But With my son. You think it's terrible because it's unfair. No, I think it's and terrible because... I look because... at all the evidence. I look at all the... I mean, you've claimed... No. You've claimed a million dollars. No. In insurance claims. Here's the bottom line. I don't believe you. You're bullshitting me like you bullshit everybody else. Well... I don't. I started to, to see what I thought was a pattern between Levi's death and Christina Carlson's death. They were different, no doubt. But when you look at it, there's also similarities. There's no reason 
No reason he couldn't have got to that bathroom. No reason. I think his intent was to stand there and watch the whole house burn up, and not just his wife. Not one of his family members meant anything to him. He told me she's a crispy critter. I get that you think you're the world's unluckiest man. No, but I'm, I'm just looking at it all thinking you're fact, not unlucky. Evidence, this is all deliberate. But the evidence proves that. Everyone that was around you was unlucky. Why does it differ? wife was unlucky. Why does the corner to this... Your son was unlucky. Hold on. Your horses were unlucky. But you're not answering my question. I can say I'm it's sitting... It's my job to answer your questions. It's your job to answer mine. <laughs> you were convicted of murdering your wife. That you had cold-bloodedly but planned... I had... Well, hang on. Had planned the murder of your wife. And by doing so, you could have killed all your children as well. Yeah, if I was in it for the money, wouldn't I have done right. that? Well, I don't know. After Carlson pleads guilty to the second-degree murder of his son, Levi, in California, prosecutors reopened the case into the house fire that had killed his first wife, Christina, 22 years before. There was one witness to that fire who could have told them what happened that day. That witness? His son, Levi, who was nearly six at the time. There's no doubt that Carl had another motive besides money to kill Levi. I always suspected that Levi knew something about the day of the fire that he just didn't want to talk about. Was my father not going to save my sisters? That's the question that's going through this kid's mind. I think that Levi got himself out of the fire, and I think only because Levi got out, it forced Carl to get the girls out. I think his intent was to stand there and watch the whole house burn up, and, and not just his wife. I think his intent was to, to see his kids go too, and to collect not just one life insurance policy, I think he intended to collect on four. He started to think, what if Levi knows this? Why let a witness be there living? He's almost six years old at that time. He knows. And um, as Levi got older, he started to worry. Carl wanted to remove the one person that really had the key to really what, what, what had happened. You yeah. took out insurance on the kids as well? Yes. And Christina was the beneficiary to them. So right. if anything happened to them, only she would get the money. But on, on her death in this fire, you got $200,000 to you. You were the only beneficiary of that. Right. The fire that kills Christina starts in the afternoon. The kids have been put down for a nap, and Christina is taking a bath. Investigators then discover burn marks in the remains of the house that indicated the fire was deliberately set trap the family. The most important evidence on this fire is an immediate pour of kerosene outside the girl's bedroom door and outside the bathroom door, and that uh, it was ignited on purpose. I was positive that the spill pattern was deliberate. If you are talking about an accidental spill of kerosene, what you should see is just a center like puddle of kerosene, but that's not what we have. Christina Carlson was unable to escape. She was unable to escape chiefly because the only way out of that bathroom was the bathroom window, the same bathroom window that had been boarded up. The investigators established that kerosene had been deliberately poured shortly well, before the fire. Here's the problem with that. You don't believe that? No, not at all. We did have a spill of kerosene. Uh, we had a kerosene heater mm. that was broke. We cleaned it up days before. After the spill, I mean, yes, you smelled a little kerosene in the air, but I, we saturated it with so much water, it wouldn't burn in a million years. Had that bathroom window not been boarded up, she'd have got out, right? Yeah, but it would have taken more time to open the window than it would to pull the board off. Right. So, uh, out of interest, when, when was that window boarded up? It was like a week, maybe less. And the thing was, is that it's easily to come off. I mean, you've got adrenaline. Your kids are there. Why not get out of the tub? She only needed seconds to get to the window or seconds to get to the door. Why did she do neither? We don't know. 
that door is here. And kerosene got spilled here. That's where they presume it started. I went out to the house the next day. And as I'm looking around, there was an ax there. So if Carl really had wanted to do something to get my sister out, he had a tool that could have knocked the boards out. Why he didn't knock this out? He should have knocked that out. There's no way she could have pulled it off. There's no reason, no reason he couldn't have got to that bathroom. No reason. Do you wish with hindsight you'd smashed your way in? Yeah, but then you look at it another way. It would be the worst thing I could do. Why? Because what would happen if I died in it too? You could have gone How? In. How? There are people who I know for a fact, if that was their wife, they'd have broken into the house. Some people would, some people wouldn't. Carl, let me, let me assume for a moment you're telling me the truth, which I don't think you are. But let's assume your version of events is right. You've been oddly looking at it. You've been now, oddly unemotional well, about the deaths of your wife and son because in this interview. So here's your chance. How did it feel? To... Is me sitting here crying going to give me any sympathy? No, I didn't get a fair trial in California. I didn't do it. That's facts. What's facts is you sitting here as a convicted murderer. That's right. But why hasn't the death well, certificate? Murder of your wife and the why hasn't the death your, certificate son? ever been admitted? Why in the are you court? sitting here for double murder of a wife and son? What you can't disprove is the timing of these insurance policies being taken out and the deaths and, of your wife right, and, and like, son where you are the sole beneficiary. Twice is not a coincidence. Not what it involves your but, wife and son. Right. When Christina died, Colette told Carl she wanted to see her sister's body. I told Carl that I wanted to see Chris. You know, I said, I want to see my sister. And he said, you can't. And I asked him, why not? And he told me she's a crispy critter. And that was how he explained the death of my sister to me. Um, I think that's the real Carl. I think very few people see that. Murderers. As illogical as they may seem to the normal person, there's something behind it, right? Here, there's nothing behind it other than money. Carl looked at his family members as a meal ticket. You're a killer, aren't you? No. You're not the unluckiest man in the world. Well, do You're you... You're a ruthless killer. Not one of his family members meant anything to him. He doesn't kill them with his bare hands. He doesn't stab them. He doesn't shoot them. He creates a hazardous situation and then sits back and lets the situation kill them. Six years after Carl Carlson pleads guilty to murdering his son Levi, he is convicted of the first-degree murder of his wife, Christina. Should he manage to serve out his time in New York State, he knows he'll spend the remainder of his life in a prison in California. You're a killer, aren't you? No. I think you've deliberately done all these things for money. For money. I think you killed your wife for money. I think you killed your son for money. God knows what would have happened to your grandchildren who you took life insurance out to make another fast buck. Here's my That's thing. That's why you're sitting here. That's why no, you're here. I, I'm, I, I'm sitting That's here. That's why you be, won't be getting be, out. You're talking about an individual who has the capacity to kill his own offspring and a woman that he professes that he loved for money. And that's because Carl's a psychopath. He doesn't have any feelings of remorse. Your two granddaughters uh, at your sentencing that had victim impact statements read by Christina's sister, Colette. And I've got them here. I just want to get your reaction. Electra was 10 and she wrote, Carl, you are the worst grandfather. I bet you don't know what love, kind or kindness means. P.S. I hope you pay the price. And then Ivy, who was uh, eight, and she wrote, Dear Judge, I don't want Carl to get out of jail because I don't want him ruining my life like he did to Daddy, from Ivy Carlson. When you hear that... It hurts. What did you feel at the time? These are your grand granddaughters. I don't remember ever hearing that. That was their victim statement. But... You don't remember it? I don't remember it. How could you forget that? 
believe me, everything's such a blur when you're in the court, you know. That wouldn't be etched on your mind forever? You gotta get, you have to get tough skin. He was calling me from the jail during the trial. He was telling me that, did you see the jurors? They look so scraggly. What about the one with that big ass? What do they wear, clothes from Walmart? And it's so bizarre. After he got arrested, he, you know, was still writing to me. He wanted me to help him, you know, convince people that he was innocent. Why does he think I would help him? I'm the one that got him arrested. After he was arrested, Aaron Carlson, uh, his uh, oldest daughter she meets her father in, in the visitation room and the first thing he says to her is wow you look just like your dead mother especially your boobs he's just a deranged individual you're not the unluckiest man in the world well do you... you're a ruthless killer and you've done it for cash and they finally caught up with you they finally caught up well, with you I'm, I'm and when they just... caught up with you because on your son you just got it wrong and made it too obvious and the payout no. was too big. That's not a coincidence, yeah, Carl. Why? That's a guy who gets so greedy, he does too much. I hope prison life is horrible for Carl, to be honest. Anything you would like to say, Mr. Carlson? No. Any apology? It doesn't hurt for him to feel some misery for the harm that he's caused others. Look, Carl, in the end, it's a tragedy for you that you went down that road, and it's a bigger tragedy for the people whose lives you took. And I just hope you can live with your conscience. Well, and I, my advice to you would be at some stage, stop kidding yourself, stop playing this game of it, pretending this is all some gigantic coincidence and you're just really unlucky, and just come clean. But, your, your families might have more respect for you if you did actually tell I'm the truth. Gonna, I'm not going That's to, all, Carl. After the plea. All right, listen. I gotta leave it there. All right. But thank you for your time. Yep. Okay. Well, that was the end of that interview with Carl Carlson, who wants us all to think he's just the world's most unlucky person. And he continues to protest his innocence. But when you look at the cavalcade of incidents here, you can only reach one conclusion Carl Carlson is not unlucky, he's evil. I'm Emily Campagno. As a lawyer, I've spent many hours with convicted felons inside the walls of prisons. Those are conversations and experiences you never forget. Now, Piers Morgan is joining me here in a slightly less intense environment to take you inside the killer interview. Carl Carlson. Yes. His horses died. His wife died, his son died. What was your reaction when he called himself the unluckiest man in the world? Well, I knew that Carl Carson wasn't an unlucky person. He was a cold-hearted, very sadistic mass killer of people that he loved or purported to love. And not just people, but prize horses or cars that got torched or pretty much anything he could think of that he could take an insurance policy out on and then claim the money. And he didn't care if it was a wife or a son or a horse or a car. If you were in his orbit and he could get money on insurance, you were dead. What are your thoughts on greed as a motive? I think there are lots of motivations for murder. Uh, you know, some of the biggest ones are obvious. Passion can be a motivation for murder. Um, but greed is a particularly awful one. That people would be driven to kill someone not because of emotions or because of gang rivalry or because of whatever it may be, but purely for money. That they would kill people, even people that they were married to or a child that they brought into the world. That they would kill them for insurance money. It's unspeakable. There's a particular vileness about greed being a motivating factor for murder, I think. And did you experience anything in your interaction with him while you shook his hand, anything that alerted you to such a vile, insidious quality about him? 
I knew from the moment he sort of bounded in, quite chirpy, quite confident, that he was utterly convinced that he was going to persuade me he was just this really unlucky guy. I'm really unlucky. His wife died in a house fire. His son falls under a truck. You know, his horses all die in a house, in, in a barn fire. His cars all get torched. Just one thing after another. God, what about that, huh? He genuinely thought that he could sit there spewing this crap to me and I was just going to fall for it. And there was a moment, as there is with a lot of these interviews, when I'm kind of, you know, just engage with them and get the story and get enough in the, in the can for a show. And then I switch. And then I go into, I don't believe a word you've been telling me. And in that moment, with him in particular, you could see his like, the blood run out of his face. Because until then, he's thinking, maybe, maybe he's persuading me. And this is good for him. And then I, I just looked him in the eye and went, I don't believe a word you're saying. And from that moment, it obviously becomes a very different interview. It becomes more contentious. He's much more defensive. And then by the end, he was just angry and stomped off. Did you feel he wanted to please you? Or did he see you as an arbiter representative of greater society? No, Carl Carson is just the world's biggest bullshitter. And he just thought he could bullshit me into oblivion. And I would just believe him. Do you believe he would have kept engaging in these insidious acts with insurance and murder if he hadn't been caught? I have absolutely no doubt Carl Carson would have carried on insuring people and things and killing or destroying them for financial gain for as long as he lived. It was a, an obsessive greed and desire to just make as much money as he could and he didn't care who died or what got torched in the process. Thank <laughs> you.